If you have a big buck, a nice looking deer on your property with some antler characteristics you really love, should you pass on that buck? Well, if you want those traits to go around, sure. But remember this myth about deer. The doe is the one that spreads 60% of the genetic traits along. Did you know that some of the things you think you know about deer might be the very things that are holding you back from having more success in the woods? Today we're going to look at the most common myths when it comes to the whitetail. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. This is where it all begins. Best hunting day ever. This is Deer and Deer Hunting TV. You know, one of the most fascinating and I would say misunderstood aspects of white-tailed deer is the sex dynamic in the herd. And what I mean by that is what percentage of a fawn is related to the buck and how much is related to the doe? And a lot of times people think that you can manipulate the sex structure among a herd, like we talk about taking out a call buck or something like that. And that somehow is going to affect what types of bucks are going to be produced. If you have a big buck, a nice looking deer on your property with some antler characteristics you really love, should you pass on that buck? Well, if you want those traits to go around, sure. But remember this myth about deer. The doe is the one that spreads 60% of the genetic traits along. So she's the one that's got actually more to say how your future bucks are gonna look than that buck prancing around and doing all of the breeding. When you look at a buck and you think, I'm gonna take that buck out because I don't want him breeding. In a wild population especially, it's really not gonna make that much of a difference. So the key take home here is you really can't do much on a free ranging population. And what you should understand is that the white tailed doe, she holds most of those cards in the future genetics. Another deer hunting myth is that the big old mama doe is the best doe to take when you're doe hunting and you're trying to manage a population. Those fawn of the year does, those are the first ones that are actually gonna die in a hard winter over and opposed to an older doe. Those are the ones that are gonna survive. So if you're in a hard hit area where it, you got some winter conditions going on, maybe consider shooting a little bit more of a balanced ratio. A few older does, a few medium age does, and especially those yearling or those young of the year fawn does. Because when winter hits, those are the ones that are gonna die first. If you wanna take deer from all age classes, to help balance not only sex structure, but age structure on that land. And what this helps is it helps bring that population down without fracturing these individual doe groups, because as we know, they are social creatures, white-tailed does are, and they live in maternally related groups. If I take out all the big mama does, what that causes is chaos in the deer herd, because now you have all these younger individuals vying for those good spaces and it's gonna be much more difficult for you to manage the does if you're not taking them across a wide spectrum of the age classes. Coming up, Dan and Mark shed light on a couple more of their favorite deer hunting myths. Then Mark heads to Southeast Montana for an annual hunt with J&J &J Guide Service. You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. 
This segment of Deer and Deer Hunting TV is brought to you by Hunt Stand. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Cuddyback. Cuddy Link, 16 cameras, one cell plan, $10 per month. Hornady, accurate, deadly, dependable. Get armed and deadly with Easton FMJ arrows. And by Scent Killer Gold with Hunt Dry Technology Plus. Apply it, dry it, and go hunt. This segment of Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Redneck Blinds. So if we haven't already worked up your blood and have you thinking and maybe shaking your fist at the screen at us on some of these myths, here's another myth that has been proven through research to be incorrect. And that goes like this. Some southern areas of the country have huge bodied deer because they have a northern genetic whitetail that was trans located there from Wisconsin and Michigan or Minnesota back in the old days. In less than a generation or two, 10 years or less, those genetics are bred out and gone. You've got big bucks, well, hopefully because it's just good genetics in the area and you're doing a good management program on your property. Keeping populations in check and below carrying capacity and keeping that habitat flourishing with smart forestry practices, smart land management practices, implementing food plots, those types of things help those deer become healthier. The deer they have were always nice sized deer no matter what. Another myth is that you can stockpile bucks on your property by simply letting them go and letting them grow. We know that's not true. And it's pretty much true no matter how big your property is. You just can't keep too many of those mature deer around. And the reason is simple. They want to be segregated. They want to move out to other areas and disperse. They don't want to be living amongst each other, side by side, holding hooves. It's, I don't like to equate animals to humans, but here's the, here's the example. No different than in high school. Once you, you're, you're a high school boy and you're going through school and you're trying to find your way, you're gonna find your niche. You're gonna find your niche, no matter where that is, that buck is gonna find his niche. Is it gonna be on your property? Maybe, maybe not. But get it out of your head that just because you're passing up deer, you're gonna have a ton more bucks to hunt next year. It doesn't work that way. Be happier with providing the food, cover, and low hunting pressure that's gonna attract deer to your property and you're gonna be a lot happier and better off in the long run. Now that Dan and Mark have shared their knowledge on these common deer hunting myths, let's head to Montana where Mark meets up with his good friend, Rich Snyder, for another whitetail hunt at J&J Guide Service. Last season, I had the distinct pleasure of hunting with J&J Guide Service. Rich and his crew of guides, they're top notch. Based out of the little Montana town in eastern Montana of Ekalaka, you can't find a more quaint and beautiful little community. And it's surrounded by some of the best big game hunting on the continent. Now last year, we hunted a little creek bottom and that creek bottom was full of whitetails. It turned out to be one of my favorite spots on all of the areas they hunt. This season, well, Rich said, why don't we just go start out at that creek bottom again? There are a lot of whitetails there. They're coming off the fields at sunrise and going back out at dusk, and we will see a lot of deer. Now, having hunted there last year, I, uh, I didn't have to argue with Rich too much. It's a good spot. There are deer everywhere. Our plan was to sneak in, but the forecast wasn't looking so mm, great. There was going to be high winds, a chance of moisture, and even fog rolling in. Was that going to play into my success on this hunt? We were going to find out, but one thing was for certain, we were going to see deer. Stay tuned. You're watching Deer and Deer Hunting TV. This segment is brought to you by Outdoor Edge Knives and Tools. From field to freezer and everything in between. This segment of Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Matthews.
Well, the weather forecast was spot on. We woke up that morning, the wind was slowly starting to kick up, it was cloudy. You could even feel every once in a while a speck of moisture on your face. But it didn't take long when the sun started coming up behind the cloud cover for the whitetails to show up. Our first setup, it wasn't successful in bringing a buck in, but it did push us further into the cover where all the deer were stacking up and trying to get out of the weather conditions that were about to really unravel here. And while we were sneaking up, Rich saw a group of deer across the creek from us in some pretty thick, pretty thick, dense vegetation. And he said, let's sneak in a little closer and take a look. Once we had made a move about another 100 yards or so, Rich turned around and said, there's a shooter up there. He looks good, but I need a better look. We moved a little further, and he said, that buck is the one that I think you'll like. Now, I'm not opposed to getting down dirty and crawling, and I could see right away, I've got to get closer. I dropped to my knees, and luckily I didn't have to crawl, because the grass was just enough to keep me hidden hit my knees and start crawling ahead. Even had to crawl through a barbed wire fence. Once I got to a little opening where it provided me about a 50 yard window on either side out where the deer were gonna come through, that's where I knew I had to set up. He's right down my barrel. You see him? I'm not shooting. You see Huh? Perfect. I settled on his shoulder and bam! That happened super fast. Richard spotted that buck up in this brush and they crossed on the ice, came up across this field and that buck was chasing. They never saw me crawl up into position here. I didn't even have time to range him. Everything was unfolding so fast. I collected my gear and then I dialed my rifle scope power way low so I could make sure I could take a shot if I needed to, if the buck was still alive. Then I checked to make sure I had another horny cartridge racked and off we went to see what was there to make a great ending to my Montana hunt. Well, we wrapped that hunt up in perfect style, great, test of the bullet, a great hunt in Montana, and uh, he's gonna be fine eating yet too. He doesn't look too wore down, isn't he? Be good. All, right. All positive. Excellent. Well, congrats. Appreciate you Thank coming you. out. Thank you, sir. That was fun. With us. So while Rich was driving the truck around through these cattle pastures, I had to get the deer from the kill spot over to the creek, down a steep bank, then I had to test the ice to make sure I wouldn't go through while dragging that big bulky buck across. One time I fell through the ice over on the Big Sioux River in South Dakota, I was 17 below, and by the time I got back to the truck, my foot was a like a one of those square ice things you get out of the ice. Um, block of ice. These are the type of blood trails I wish I could find when I shoot a deer. My daughter can ice skate really good, but so can I. Mr. Cameraman, send me my rifle down. Now you want me to, oh shit, I'm going down! Yes! Now watch me go in right here. Deer camp, whether it's you and your buddies on a DIY hunt out in the woods, or at a great outfitting camp like J&J &J Guide Service, one of the special endings to these hunts is breaking that deer down, packaging it up, and making it ready for winter meals ahead. Whenever you create a great venison meal, it just brings back the memories of the hunt and what happened, whether it's Montana, Wisconsin, or Texas. First time you bite into a good chunk of venison, yeah, that hunt is right there with you forever. Deer and Deer Hunting is brought to you by Sever Broadheads, straight through it.
10 point crossbow technologies, there is no substitute. And by Outdoor Edge, make the cut. Here's a real simple tip that I hope will help you become a more successful deer hunter. For me, deer hunting is all about scent control. And what I try to do is take a total scent free approach when going deer hunting. My boots, my footwear is the first step of defense. Because when I'm walking to my blinds, to my stands and back, I don't wanna be leaving scent on the ground and that's where the scent is coming from, are my boots. How many times do you see this? Guys going to the gas station wearing their boots that is picking up so much scent, and when you walk to and from your stands, deer will pattern you really quickly. Here's my approach to it, really simple. I have specific footwear, some pull-on slippers, some mock style sandals here, that I basically, I wear those while I'm driving. That's basically all I'm gonna have on my feet when I'm in a vehicle, when I'm going to a gas station, I'm heading to a convenience store, whatever. The other thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spray down my boots with scent killer and make sure they dry before I put them in a tote. I use a simple tote. I've used this tote for 20 years. I've had it forever. I wash it out with scent killer. I keep it scent free. And that is specifically for my boots. Now I have two different styles of boots that I use. I've got the hiking style boots and I've got the neoprene high shin type of boots. Here's a new product that I've been using. It's pretty neat. They're tote tamers from Scent Killer. And basically what these do, it's really simple. It's no zone. So a lot of people don't like the ozone because especially for, I do use ozone on other things, but I will not use my boots because what I found is it eats away at the rubber if you keep putting those in an ozone container. So these tote tamers work very simple. Now I can use these in my tote, or I can just stick them right in my backpack or right in the boot. Really simple, you just take the tote tamer. If I wanna put these in my boot, drop them in my boot, one in each boot, I can do that. And I can have my boot on the porch at camp or somewhere. Basically they absorb odor and they take away moisture as well. I can have them right in my boot like that. But what I like to do is I will put them in my boots and just basically keep them in this scent-free tote. I put one in each boot into the tote. Get two more, put them in my hiking boots. It's sealed up. I keep my tote in the back of my truck. I can spray the outside of that with scent killer if I want, and I'm all scent-free and ready to go. If you're new to bow hunting or even have just a few years of experience, it can be a daunting task picking out your equipment. And one of the things I've found over the years that people ask me a lot is, how heavy of a setup should I be shooting? Not just your bow poundage, but your arrow. You know, that's one of the most interesting things I find in bow hunting today. It seems like it's shrouded in secrecy. You know, how much weight should this arrow be? And how much kinetic energy is it producing? And how fast is it going? everybody gets hung up on speed. I'm here to tell you right now, you do not need a lot of kinetic energy to kill a deer while whitetail hunting. The minimum, 25 foot-pounds of kinetic energy, and you don't need much draw weight to do that. With this setup that I'm shooting, I'm producing about 78 pounds, foot-pounds of kinetic energy. So let's start with the arrow. The arrow is everything when it comes to accuracy. Yes, these bows are high speed and they deliver great kinetic energy, but it's that arrow that's the driving force. That's what's gonna make or break your difference when you're bow hunting. Now I'm shooting FMJs. The thing about these arrows is they are skinny, which allows for less wind resistance going down range. The veins, these bully veins, are short little two inch veins. Another thing that adds to accuracy. And I can put a, expandable broadhead on there like a sever and I'm going to be able to shoot a lot farther than I would as opposed to the old days when I had a traditional style broadhead with blades that almost acted like wings. But one of the questions I often get from people is how much weight should I be shooting on my arrow? 
And what I always say is if you get close to 400 grains, that's gonna push a lot of kinetic energy and it's gonna result in bone breaking performance and also a lot of pass throughs, especially with those expandable broad ends. Now, 25 foot pounds is the low end of the scale. You get to 50 foot pounds of kinetic energy. Now we're talking 30 yards, easy shot, broadside, slightly quartering away, plenty enough energy to kill a white tail. My personal setup, I'm only shooting 55 pounds on this Matthews VXR, but I have about a 440 to 450 grain arrow. So that's producing a well over 70 foot pounds of kinetic energy. That's good for elk or moose. Now guys that really get extreme with it, they can be pushing 90 foot pounds of kinetic energy and more. So you're gonna say, well, I would want more kinetic energy. Why, why wouldn't I want less? Why would I want less? More kinetic energy is gonna help you because that means you're shooting a lot faster speeds. And with faster speeds, that means you can shoot farther distances. Farther distances means that first pin might take you, instead of 25 yards, might take you 30, 35 yards, even 40 yards for guys who are really blazing fast. I don't need that because I know bow hunting is a short range proposition. For me, it's gonna be way under 40 yards, usually under 30 yards. And with a setup like this, you're gonna be gold.